Good, good evening. My name is Jill Berry. I'm the executive director here at Morgan. I'm delighted you are the few, the proud, the healthy that are here with us tonight. So uh, there's a lot of uh, news out there, and right now we are taking measured responses. We will, I will tell you, we disinfected everything this afternoon, so uh, hopefully we're good for another 24 hours or so. Um, this is the third spe um, speaker series we have, and uh, it really is a wonderful program. I am very excited that we actually have two sponsors for tonight. Um, Elizabeth from Baxter, who you've heard from weekly, is the series sponsor. But tonight we also had Nancy Hearn from, and I always just called Saul Ewing, so I wrote it down. Saul Ewing, Ernstine, and Lair is our lecture series tonight. So I would welcome Nancy to say a few words. Thank um, it's a, it's always a joy for me to come to Morgan, and I'll, I have to tell this story. I always tell this story because um, I, I'll never forget that day. But it was seven, uh, seven, It was 1989, and I believe, and George Washington was uh, returning to Washington for his inaugural. And you may all remember that he left Mount Vernon by carriage, and he took exactly the same route he'd taken 200 years earlier and traveled through Princeton and visited Morgan. And this was announced in the paper, so I took uh, three out of the five of our little boys over here to meet George Washington. Mm -hmm. And we waited out front, and there was a small crowd, but he pulled in in his carriage, and he got out, and he greeted everyone and bowed, and he signed little copies of the American Constitution. And it was a thrilling moment for me as a mother to see history recreated right here. Um, you know, they were able to touch him and speak to him. And I thought, this is, this is an important place. Uh, and uh, so I've always felt very close to Morgan. And on behalf of Saul Ewing, I'm very pleased to be here tonight to, um, uh, as a sponsor of this event. I think this is gonna be a great, fun lecture. Uh, I'm glad to see that uh, old school American elegance still exists. I was looking through the books outside. Um, they're lovely. There are curtains on the windows, unlike me in many of the millennial rooms that I have been to recently. So this is going to be just great, and enjoy it, and thank you very much. on um, this year's or this month's um, series because I have been at three of the spots that you are chronicling this month and the most recent one was Maine with a friend of mine in the back um, back 
row. We were at Mount Mont Desert Island in Maine, the Garden Home of America for, of course, the most wonderful garden tour in the, in the world. So when we started talking about this, I thought, oh, that is such a wonderful series. You know, the East Coast travel log. You start in Maine, and then you go to Newport, and then you go to Washington, D.C., to my favorite garden, Dumbarton Oaks, and then you go to the Flagler in Palm Beach. How does it get any better than that? <laughs> I am, though, I have to say, a bit partial to Newport. I know the, all the other spots pretty well, but I am very partial to Newport. And I've always said I wrote these two books as my Valentine's to Newport. I'm a newbie to Newport. I've been there 30 years. My husband's from there originally. But um, I've been there long enough to know how special it is. And yet, every day to me is a pinchy moment to be living in a place that is so gorgeous. So I think I have between the 85 images that you will be seeing over the next 45 minutes. And I hear that the lights might go on in 45, off in 45 minutes. I will keep talking until the, <laughs> until the slides are until the slides are finished. Let me push this back just a little bit. Um, I'm, I'm going to start with one of my absolute very, very, very fa favorite shots. Newport, of course, is about water. But I think what so many people don't understand who have not been to Newport is that Newport is also on an island, so we are surrounded by water. This, of course, is Hammersmith Farm, which is part of an evolution that has been going on of people actually buying houses that have been public or open to the public, like this had been for 25 or 30 years when the Auchincloss still owned it. And um, a Goldman Sachs gentleman from New York and his wife and five, four children bought this over 20 years ago and have done the most gorgeous job on it, but the most important thing is, it is now back being a private home again. But I was just gonna say, one favorite shot. I'm sure many of you are familiar with the movie High Society. Remember the opening shot where they pan up the coastline of Newport? This is that shot. And of course you can see in the background the, the Newport Bridge, which only went in in 1969 prior to that. You had to take a ferry, and I just missed that by about 20 years. <laughs> we came to Newport and started coming to Newport in 87. Oh, pardon me, I've got to slide off here. Um, so I, I um, just missed the, um, just missed having to, having to take the ferry. That one large gray house, uh, large house you see there, of course, is the Breakers. Um, having written two books and done a number of interviews, it's become so apparent to me, and one thing I love about Newport is that there are so many stories. I always say, <laughs> one thing we know about Newport is that there are stories and the interconnectedness that go along with those stories. And that's how I came up with my 2020 theme for the talks that I'll be doing this year, this being my first one, thank you, Debbie, um, is Tales of Newport, to play on that. And of course, <laughs> What's one of the biggest stories that we've been aware of for at least the last, I'm going to guess, 12 years, um, 10 or 12 years, Downton Abbey. <laughs> and as I said, I adore Newport. It's really like living in another place in time. And then every three years, coaching weekend comes along, and it just reinforces that magical impression that you have of living there. I don't know if very many of you all are familiar with it, but it's an old, old, old tradition that Alfred Gwynne Vanderbilt brought to the United States, specifically Newport, in 1888. It was he who introduced it uh, to America and Newport, from England, of course, and it is quite the event. It is a weekend of frivolities, of coursing around, eight miles around Aquidneck Island, of which Newport is the southern point. And if you think a hostess in the summer has a difficult time um, waiting until coaching comes along, she not only has to worry about the house guests, she has to worry about their horses, their coaches, their groomsmen, and the other liveried staff that go along with the whole system. There are many layers to this. And to me, what makes coaching so fascinating is it, is it is a tradition, it is a sport, and it is a social pastime. 
The point was made very clearly to me when I was interviewing um, the son who run who had run and does still continue to um, run the coaching every three years of his father, that it is very um, special to Newport because they indeed call upon people, quote unquote. It is not just parading. It is actually people on the coaches who are going to visit other houses. So they start on Thursday and they don't finish until Sunday morning. And they go around the island, they'll go to Hammersmith Farm for um, <laughs> cute Edie, Edie Kiernan's uh, tipsy punch. Um, and then they'll move on to da da da. And then they will finish at the Cushing's and pull out the champagne and light the you know, carriage lamps, coach lamps. Um, but one place they always go, um, twice, Thursday morning, they can go by Miramar, another Goldman Sachs gentleman who came to town um, and restored this 30,000 square foot house, um, including the facade, limestone, and one of the first stories I have to tell you here, and back again to Dot Mabby, is that this is, was originally the home of the Widener family. If you'll remember in Downton Abbey, uh, the, the descendancy of, of um, Downton Abbey depended on the heir. Well, the true heirs to Downton Abbey were both killed or went down on the Titanic, and that is how Hugh Grantham, and we, as the story picks up there, um, and how the story started, um, goes back to the house that you're looking at right here because Mrs. Widener and her husband were building this home, uh, went to Europe to shop, as they did in those days, for things for your 30,000 square foot um, little cottage, um, and to find a chef and a few other servants. Um, but only Mrs. Widener came home. Her son and his father went down on the Titanic. And that is a true story, and that is the house where it happened. That, and that was very part of it, very much if you remember, the Titanic and how they lost the original heirs to um, Downton Abbey. And here again, the coaches. You've heard the, uh, the term coat, uh, four in hand. There are always four horses. The whip is both the owner and the driver of the coaches. Those are two words that we you know, hear often. Um, I had to take this video of Downton Abbey. You know how the, when you have guests coming, <coughs> how the staff used to line up in front of that Abbey. So I was over that Thursday morning, I live about three houses away. And um, I said, David, you all just line up. Let me take a Downton Abbey picture. <laughs> so, and he loved it, he loves this. And then, um, as I said, they go around the island and there they are um, down by Green Bridge, way off on Ocean Drive. Uh, David is on Bellevue Avenue. This is the back. Uh, the 4,000 square foot terrace on the back side of Miramar that is on the water side. This happened to be the most recent coaching, which was two years ago. Um, and they had, I have to show you, this is so much fun. At this point in time, he, he was married. And his wife chose to have, I found this very amusing since I grew up in Beverly Hills, California, that she chose to turn Miramar into the Palm uh, Polo Lounge at the Beverly Hills Hotel. Uh, so you can see the little bit of pink. Well, wait until you see what she got going with. <laughs> now that was two years ago. And um, three years before that, it had been the 100th anniversary of Miramar. So they indeed had another Friday night um, black tie and gender dance um, ball. Now, I just had to give you a few, so you've seen three perspectives on that. The houses, I mean, the horses and the carriages and how absolutely gorgeous they are. And this, as I said, goes on through the whole, through the whole weekend. Saturday, there is always a big luncheon at Greenvale Vineyards, which is up at the north of the um, island. And that is the day that all the ladies come out in their hats. So I, I, I sort of thought maybe you all would want to see this. <laughs> I'll just back up a second, so you, and that's one of the coaches. But I, let's see how the um, see how the, the uh, livery, the red livery um, 
groomsmen and everything. It's very much as it would have been back in Downton Abbey days. <laughs> and um, Marble House, of course. So I finished the Downton Abbey story with uh, Consuela Vanderbilt who grew up, many of you may know this story, but there are some details that you may not know. Um, she grew up at Marble House. She was a daughter of William K. and Alva Vanderbilt, who, I have to mention importantly this year because of suffrage, Alva Vanderbilt was one of the three most important suff suffragists at this point in time when they were trying to get the vote passed for women to be able to vote. Uh, unfortunately, She's sort of been lost in the shuffle as being a Vanderbilt who locked her daughter in her room until she would agree to marry the ninth Duke of Marlborough. And um, uh, that was a period in time when all of the wealthy and new wealthy heiresses of America um, were married off to English titles. The Duke of Marlborough was probably the highest ranking title, so um, Constable Vanderbilt is probably the, probably the female who's gotten the most attention um, about what they call, referred to as dime princesses. And the dowry that went with her, and of course then stayed with the Duke after their divorce, was approximately 120 million in today's dollars. Um, I was at Blenheim in December and met with members of the family and um, some people who are archivists because I've been doing a story on it from on my blog. And they, they make it very clear that without her money, Blenheim would have fallen apart. A beautiful Blenheim but from the roof so to everything that you can think of. The gardens were put in that were, had never been there before and that was because of Consuela Vanderbilt's dowry. I was surprised. I didn't know how they would exactly present her when I was talking about being from Newport and we were comparing stories. And I was actually touched that they were they were so kind about her. They obviously hadn't met her because she and the Duke were married in 1895. But um, anyway, I thought that was lovely of them, and certainly they're appreciative of what her dowry did for that gorgeous, huge, huge. Pile, pile, as they refer to them in um, England. So this is this is the front of Marble House where Constable Vanderbilt grew up. Now Miramar is on the water, as is this wonderful house. Does that not look like the quintessential summer house? I mean, whether it's Newport or Nantucket or Cape Cod, it just makes you feel so good to look at it. And even from this angle, you can probably tell that, um, let me back up a second. Um, you can probably see where the original house was, the original sort of federal shingle, and then all of these uh, balconies and porches are added basically around the entire house, which makes it not only larger, but makes a house that's even more enjoyable if you're on the water and want views and <clears throat> summer breezes. To me, the story here is and, and which prompted me to write my book about yet the most recent evolution in Newport's 381 year history. And that is the refreshing, the rebirth of Newport, this time by a group of young people who have come to town, a group of not quite so young, but who are enjoying it a lot in the summer before they head off to Florida. Um, it is because of technology. Who would have thought that technology in Newport, old Newport, Rhode Island, would have gone together? But it is because you can now work any place. You can work on your boat. You can work in Newport. You could work in, on a mountaintop. Because of you, you have your laptop or your phone or whatever it may be. So that has just opened the gates for a whole group of people who not only are young, um, this, this couple are probably a little closer to my age, but um, they're still young. Um, at, any, at any rate, <clears throat> he was in finance in Connecticut. He, he has brought his money in and has discovered, I, they're good friends of ours, and I just love him so much for what he has done with this house. 
They came to town thinking they just wanted a little beach house in Newport. <laughs> and then a realtor showed them this one. And the rest is history. And as he said when he was walking through it, now this house had been in the same family since it was built 100 years ago. So you can imagine that it did need some work. And he, he's funny, he says, I remember walking through when a realtor was showing it to me, and, and I looked at him, he said, I thought, what sucker's gonna buy this house? <laughs> well, he was that sucker, and he discovered a preservationist side to himself that I don't think he ever knew he had. And they came in, and everything they have done is so exquisite, you wouldn't even know that anyone else had moved in, except that it has been refreshed. As a very witty friend of mine says, it's as though a dowager had taken a young lover. <laughs> and it truly is, because they did all of that expensive work you know, behind, behind the scenes, you know, the plumbing, the electrical, the reinforcing the basement, the ceiling, the whole roof, the whole nine yards. And um, they've kept going. They bought two houses that are surrounding them and have fixed those up and have created a compound, all keeping the integrity of that house as it really was. It doesn't look any different. The only difference is that he has added a, per, a, a port share that was there originally, right where you see the steps at the left side of the, um, of the camera, of the picture. And I find this, this is the entry hall. It's a very odd, but it's the original entry hall. And the um, bathroom is just to the left, literally with that pull chain wooden toilet. I didn't put that in, I do have it in the book, but it's, I didn't think I put it in here. <laughs> but anyway, one of the porches, they have porches on three sides um, with the lattice, and of course, you know, parts of the world, you paint your ceiling blue because it, it keeps away the bugs or it gives away the, the, you know, the birds. And um, also, it just gives you a sense of being half outside. And the house, it's, I wouldn't say it's millennialized. It does have draperies. Yeah. <laughs> Got a kick out of that remark. Um, but it's bright and it's happy. All they did was paint. They didn't touch, move rooms. They didn't take down walls. This is a bar. It is not a kitchen. The kitchen still is originally in the basement. Which when you think about it, from a catering standpoint, and smells and parties, if you're entertaining a lot, Having it in the basement is not a bad thing. It has a dumb waiter, but it's also a very easy walk up the stairs. So this, when you look at it, they go, oh, that must be part of the kitchen. No, this is really the bar right off of the um, entry hall. And sort of the beginning of the mudroom at the um, back end of the house. And this is the kitchen in the lower level, which has a lot of light and um, you know half windows in it. So it's, and of course, fun place, especially with with children to go down and play and be casual. And this is that great sweeping porch that you saw in the first shot. I mean, you can do everything. They, you know, there's a piano at one end and there's you know a table there and the other end is, is something else. So you can go out there and have three different groups and they, they can't even hear each other. And there it is in, as the sun sets, looking west. <laughs> And that shot, I absolutely adore. That's taken from Bailey's Beach. It overlooks Bailey's Beach, which is at the end of the uh, cliff walk. And we're going to switch from the water and go to Bellevue Avenue. And to me, this, the, the keen story here, and there are many underlying ones, but it's the, the names that have lived in this house and what they mean in American history. Um, this is one of only two homes in America that Ogden Codman, the you know, famous quote-unquote decorator of the period, who also wrote the book, The Decoration of Houses with Edith Wharton. This is only one of, one of only two houses in America where he was both the architect as well as the interior designer. Um, very federal, New England federal facade, beautiful, um, um, fence work and gates. The brick wall goes around the entire block. It's on one city block. My husband and I had made a bid on this house before we decided that we really wanted to build our own. 
and a year after we did, and Ron, a friend of ours, bought this, and um, as soon as he moved in, I saw him starting to work on that eight foot, nine foot high brick wall that went around the entire, and I was so glad we hadn't bought that house. <laughs> a lot of work. But when I was putting together my first book, there was one specific reason why I chose each house for itself as different from another. And in this one, it is because of the disparity between the federal New England facade and the interior when you walk into this house. It just, now you watch, I think it'll take your breath away. And it is what Ogden Cotton is known for these monumental, dramatic entrances, but it's not just there. It's a three-story high Adams atrium. All of that uh, plaster work, and the current owner had to, it's another thing, along with the brick wall, he had to restore all that plaster work, repaint it, and here it is looking at it from the third floor. Would you ever expect that to be inside that federal colonial house? <laughs> Absolutely, that scrumptious shade of, of apricot. And this is a tiny little room. You know, one thing that amazed me when I was doing, I've done 17 houses in two books, so I have 34 houses. I have always been amazed at how intimate these houses feel, large houses feel when you go into them. This is the little music room. Now, the, book, the house was originally bit built for Ogden Codman's husband, I mean cousin, by, um, he, as I said, he was the architect. But the second owner was somebody named Jane Pickens, who was a singer in the 50s and the 60s, 40s and the 50s, I believe, and she married Walter Hoving of Tiffany fame. And they lived here and entertained, if you can imagine, in the poshest of ways, given that gorgeous house. And this was one little room. She was a Sunday painter. And there's one little part of this room that I love to include because most people don't get to see it. As part of her Sunday painting was um, sort of an attempt at trompe l'oeil. And she did, um, she did books. And um, she would do each book about one of her friends and give it an appropriate title. Well, if you look on the left, you'll see The Duke and Duchess of Windsor. Windsor, my romance, and they were indeed her house guests, and that's why that book has that um, particular title to it. I mean, you can see the Hitchcocks, and the, but it's mentioning Newport people as well as house guests. Now, back to you saw the facade. Ron Fleming bought the house just about the time that we were building ours, so about 1998, I think, and. Um, you talk about entertaining. This man's social calendar exhausts me just to read it. It's three pages long for just summer. He has something going on every single weekend. It's so philanthropic and so <clears throat> good to charities and letting him, them use his house. But this particular, this was about three years ago. The house was 101 years old. Ron was 70 and his son was 21. So he had three reasons to celebrate. As I said, this was three or four years ago. This was the opening of the three-day-long weekend invitation. He loves monkeys. He thinks we have a lot in common with him in, <laughs> in our own funny ways. Um, and was this? This is the June eighteenth. This was something I don't think that's ever been done in Newport. Funny enough, the night that he, or the afternoon that he was having his New Orleans funeral parade down Bellevue Avenue to Bailey's Beach, we were having a party at our house. We happened to be on the way. <laughs> I said, oh, Ron, just come by when you're, if you're walking by. I mean, it's a two, I don't think half the guests realize it was a two-mile uh, walk from his house to the, to the beach for a barbecue. And I look up, and all of a sudden, I hear this music, and I go by, and I, I totally forgot, and I told him to come by with some friends. He had a hundred people, <laughs> and they came in, they came around to the back garden, like two barges are standing there awestruck with a table about this big, and people start running up and everything, and I had to come over and say, oh, 
we decided to keep it for a month. Sorry, I don't know if we could handle 100 people here with, I don't know if we have enough liquor. <laughs> but anyway, luckily they were just coming in to pass through and then keep on going down to the next house. I think they went down to David Ford's at Miramar. Um, but anyway, we were on the way, and it was just coincidental that I happened to be having a party that night, too. So um, here's what it looked like. <laughs> As I said, it's at least a two-mile walk. And Bailey's Beach is just beyond where they, um, where they are. And then Sunday was um, the dinner dance in my favorite folly on his property of all. This is one of them. Um, and coincidentally, he and uh, Ogden Codman and his sister, for whom he, um, um, his cousin, for whom he designed the house, um, were the same family as the Darbys of Massachusetts. And Samuel McIntyre designed both this. Now, this is how clever Ron is and how much he loves his follies. That is actually a copy of a cupola of a Samuel McIntyre church in Massachusetts that Ron co-opted, of course, expanded it. And this is one of his reading rooms um, out in his garden, which I'll show you in a minute. And there it is across from his uh, Japanese garden and um, lily pond. And this is an aerial view. That is a copy, that beautiful two-story tea house is a copy of the Codman's cousin's tea house, Darby family in Connecticut, and in, in Massachusetts, and was copied and put on the property in 1920. This um, Bellevue house was built in 1910, and in 1920, that beautiful folly was um, added. And Ron Fleming has done such a gorgeous job with landscaping, much more that must used to be very open, and now he's taken uh, horn beans and just done, as you can see, a beautiful, you'll see that alley um, in a second. And there's another angle of that beautiful tea house. And the upstairs, I'm afraid that wallpaper's gone now, but I still love this, love this picture, the hand-painted wallpaper, and the upstairs for a little tea. And here is the garden that he has created, always an opportunity to build one more folly. So you have the armature that is now covered, or is starting to get covered with clematis and roses, etc. cetera. But um, look how beautiful that is. And it goes right down the middle of his property. So it sort of divides it so you don't see all the follies at the same time. And then um, it's built, added a um, breakfast room off the kitchen to the main house and then put this beautiful little terrace with a reel that's running down into one of the sweetest gardens. Not too big, but just perfect. And this, of course, I have to say is one of, personally for me, one of my very favorite houses in Newport. Here again, you can probably see where the original house has been added to, onto over on the left. It was, um, the story here to me is about Bellevue Avenue. This is one of the very first houses that was a six-acre estate um, that was designed, the house was built as a wedding gift for William Backhouse Astor's daughter in 1854. And that was the beginning of the Bellevue Avenue residential area. Up to that point, it was basically a dirt road. It's hard to believe that a town as beautiful as Newport is. Um, founded in 1639, did not have this residential street or this residential district where all of the big mansions were built until the mid-1800s. As I said, this was one of the first ones. Now, within, fortuitously, within two years, within 10 years, two gentlemen with very good taste had lived in this house, and they each brought their own talents to it. Friends of ours who bought the house bought it furnished. And um, as I said, this, from that standpoint, to me, is one of my famous, favorite homes, personally. It's light, it's bright, and here again, the rooms are not oppressively large. This is the entry hall. Um, this, is, this is the living room, which is also the ballroom that was added. When you looked at the house originally, you could see that um, big room with all the windows. 
you get lots of windows, lots of French doors. It's Newport in the summer. Get those breezes. And my favorite room in the house is the dining room with its 54 panels um, of painted Chinese scenes on silk <coughs> that have been here in this house since 19, in the early 1900s. And fortunately, with a couple sold it, they also, and unfortunately, which I really look at it, took down those panels um, and put them in their townhouse in New York. But one reason I'm so glad I wrote a book like Private Newport, this has been documented. We have this image. Look at that, with the flowers that match it so well. <clears throat> a little chinoiserie, napkin ring. And how's that? Does that look like your pantry, butler pantry at home? And back in the corner, that is the house safe. Floor to ceiling, <coughs> heavy, 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 iron, steel, whatever, safe. And the conservatory, another room that had been added over the years. Um, I'll tell you a funny little story. That's the, um, the friends of ours that own the house and have since sold it. He's a very attractive professional sailor from Rotterdam, the Netherlands. And um, he jokingly told me, he said, you know, we adore this house. And he said, but every realtor who took us out kept showing us things on the water. He said, I spend every day on the water. I didn't want to be on the water. And I said, well, I can certainly understand, but why do you have a room-sized painting of the ocean <laughs> if that's the case? I mean, it literally fits from wall to wall in this room. <laughs> oh, by the way, I think this was a Sunday morning when they'd forgotten we were coming over to photograph. <laughs> so they were very nice. They were very gracious about it. Threw on their jeans and came downstairs. <laughs> this is the John Philip Sousa room, red, white, and blue, the music room. And then, of course, the 60-foot-long um, veranda that is long enough to have you know, seating at one, at one end um, and seating at the other end that is close to the kitchen and then three or four different French doors that open onto this and then go right out through the pool, which is a new addition. This house did not have a swimming pool until the first bachelor moved in about 10 years ago, but it does add a lot, but they, that's all that's been tampered with. But here you can, you can see very clearly right here, there's the added on veranda. The top piece that you see with the two long windows was added off the master bedroom and is the bathroom and master bath and dressing rooms. To the right is um, you know, an above grounds kitchen. But my favorite piece is this clock tower. Is that not divine? That is original for the property um, but one of the bachelors over the last 10 years um, sold it to someone. Um, it's a, a very small piece of property, but broke it off and sold it for whatever reason. But the good news is that Oakwood, the house, <clears throat> is six acres, get this wonderful borrowed view. So you, unless you know the story, you assume that it's part of the property, and it was originally. But as I take you through this real quickly, obviously I'm a garden girl. Um, it is so typical of Newport of a certain period, back in the 40s and 50s. Look at that. It's just divine. Now, a young couple have moved in. Um, there are no draperies. Um, and um, they, they've used that, but they put a lot on the ground. So to me, they, they've broken it up a little too much. But I'm just happy that here again, Young people are living there, they have the money, and they can afford to buy a $10 million house on six acres in Newport. Now, I'm going to finish with a little personal. This is my home, Parterre. Uh, we did something, I mentioned that we had made a, an offer on Ron Fleming's Bellevue house. I'm so glad we didn't get it. Although I had said one thing I would never do is build a house, but we had such a divine time. Two years to build a house, two, bit, two years to create and publish a book. Uh, it seems to be my, <laughs> my MO for, for life. Um, but 
we couldn't pass on this property. It was the only property on Bellevue Avenue, and we bought it way back in 19, I think 1994, um, but we bought it for the trees. It had not been touched. It had the old beech trees, the old ginkgos, the old oaks, the old little leaf European lindens. And I'm a tree lover, and that is what took this, made the decision for me to live in this house and this property as opposed to trying to pursue something on the water. And it's built around, the centerpiece is a surprise Christmas gift that my husband gave me when we were moving into the house. Um, he's not a man who plans ahead, usually goes out Christmas Eve, luckily he likes jewelry, so that's fine, but <laughs> never surprised me. And he at this actually was probably the biggest surprise in the number of years that we've been married because he had our architect design this specifically um, for the garden, knowing how much I how much I love it. Um, it was mentioned that I have been with Bon Appetit for 11 years, so I, I have entertaining in me, and growing up a Southerner, I really do. Um, so obviously in the summer, this is where we spend our time. Color, color, and blue skies. Um, I found these little umbrellas someplace and just decided that the color was so great, and that was a theme for this particular, I can't even remember what it was, it was either a book signing or something, um, and a pond. And there is the orangery, as we call it, at night. And I have to say, it really is fanciful. And it's just, only seats about eight or 10. Um, there was a very special person who came in my life about five years ago. And um, she's almost like a grandmother to me now, and I love her to pieces. Um, she came because she was a friend of a friend and she'd never seen Newport, and she wanted to come back. So he asked if she could come. I said, of course. So they spent the weekend, and we just became fast, fast, fast friends. Um, and she mentioned that something about her birthday just happened to be around the time that she was there. And I said, well, well, we'll have a birthday party for you. And she said, oh, would you? She said, I've never had a birthday party. Well, this was her, she was 95, and she'd never had a birthday party. I thought, my goodness, I'm going to really have to go out for that. <laughs> so anyway, um, this, was, this was part of the going out and making it look magical for her. And she loves jewelry. She also um, had started a company called World, World, um, what is it? World Worldwide Weavers or Old World Weavers, and that was her favorite fabric, a toile, um, that they had produced. So the cake maker made it um, um, in a little tiny um, sheet of, of sugar. I can't believe it. It was absolutely gorgeous. And this is who it is. <laughs> she is the sweetest, cutest, most down to earth, speaks, speaks like it is. She was so, as you can see, she was absolutely shocked when the birthday cake came out. Wow. <laughs> I'm hoping I can get her back this year. She's 98. Um, and going strong. And that's another view out of the orangery. So I'm going to finish by taking you. Um, Debbie mentioned that I um, had been very involved with the Newport Flower Show. I chaired it for seven or eight years, about 10 years ago. And it's, it's coincidental and very convenient because I live right next door to Rosecliff where it's hit, where it's um, um, held. So I'm just saying, just follow me. We're going to sneak out and go around the orangery and uh, sneak through our woodland garden and go right over to Rosecliff. I'm sure most of you all have heard of Rosecliff. Great Gatsby was filmed here, any number of movies. Here come the lights. Perfect timing. Just about to finish. <laughs> <laughs> Best place to be in the summer. This opens the summer season. It's the last weekend of June. Um, all weekend, I dare say there's not a more beautiful setting for a flower show in the United States at any point in the year than this setting right here. I, I know one person who's been there. Have any, uh, anyone else in the audience been to Newport for the Newport Flower Show? Well, you might want to think about it. 
Those are 85 tents of the best shopping you've ever <laughs> Not to mention, I'm going to take you inside real quickly. My favorite uh, ballroom scene of all, and this happened to be luckily during my um, years. I'm going to take you to the front, I'm sorry. I'm going to take you around the, around the front where the gardens are designed. You might have heard of the you know, famous Blue Garden that opened a few years ago in Newport after having been restored. Um, so this was um, in honor of the Blue Garden this particular year. Isn't that wonderful? And this is the back terrace, <laughs> looking out on the water. <laughs> we have these mines that are coming out of pots and look like flower girls in the whole, the whole nine yards. But this is a scene I love so much. The, the ballroom at Rosecliff is probably the number one setting of any bride, at least on the East Coast. Newport has become a major wedding destination. I mean a major. Um, and this ballroom can seat 250, which is, makes it the largest and obviously most usable ballroom, public ballroom in, in Newport. And those are the, from the archives of the Preservation Society, a set of Mary McFadden pleated dresses. And this scene, like, aren't those delicious? Look at those sherbet colors and big windows. But the other thing that I love so much, this particular year, what is a dining room without a dragon? <laughs> and this is made up of, I don't know how many, Pineapples. Can you all tell that those are real pineapples with their tops on? Um, it's just, it's the most beautiful thing in the world. And it reminds me, in closing, um, we last December lost probably our last grand dame of Newport, O.C. Charles from Georgetown, Washington, D.C. And she had graciously written the um, foreword to my first book. And someone had told me years ago, the funniest anecdote about her, and I think it's so true as I'm showing you a dragon, which she would be the first one to admit she could be at times. Um, um, there was a new hostess in town who didn't really know all the players very well, and they invited Ozzy, because she always wanted to be at every party um, and meet, meet new people. Um, but unfortunately, she was seated next to a boar, and he stumbled, tried to get through the dinner talking, didn't do a very good job of it, and of course, as I said, the poor hostess didn't know that this man was so poor. And finally, at the end of the after dessert, he pushed his chair back and stood back, and was so polite, he turned to Otsi and said, may I drive you home? And she looked up and said, you already have. <laughs> so I finish on that note <laughs> with the dragon, <laughs> whose name might also be Otsi. Um, and the two books, the two books capture a moment in time, but I also have a blog called Private Newport, or as I say, uh, I like to say, an e-journal that um, captures Newport ongoing, weekly, every Thursday. And I'd love for you all to join the Private Newport family. I think you'll be intrigued by the, some of the posts that are, um, that are put up on Thursday. So thank you all so much for joining me, and please come to Newport. Yes, it was the Astor's Beach, uh, Beach, Beach Week. Now, what's the status of that now? What Nothing. He <laughs> finished it. Nothing's happening. Oh. It's just sitting there in a guard house and um, grass growing up and weeds. It's, I only live three, three doors from him, and that's, we're not very happy about that because he's not keeping it up. But he's done all the work on the house, and it looks absolutely gorgeous. I mean, it really was an improvement. And here again, well, someone new to town, and he had the money, and he could have torn it down, he could have done a number of things with it, but he put the money into restoring it, even taking it back to originally what it had been, which was much more elegant than what it looked like at the time it was open to the public, yet again, another 
public house and has gone private. But I, I, I wish he'd either sell it or take care of it. That's how, mm -hmm. that's how I feel about it. Any other questions? Yes. Um, back in the mid 70s or so, it's part before you were living there, the Navy moved out. Mm -hmm. And um, so, what if any, I, I was there in the early 70s, what if any change, big changes have happened <coughs> to Newport as a result of the Navy leaving, except for the officers' candidate school? And I think the War College. The War College, which of course is now probably the center of the Pentagon of war games and deciding how wars are going to be fought in the future. So even though the Navy may have pulled out, Newport is still a very, very, very important from a strategy standpoint, very important. But that's about the only change that's taken place. I was saying to someone tonight um, that I always worry about something happening to the houses. Well, now I'm forgetting that I should be worried about the five hotels that are going out this summer. So. And they're all on the, on the wall, wharves, so they don't really impact a Bellevue Avenue, but it's just it's going to be a lot more traffic. So maybe they're taking up the space that the Navy had. <laughs> they used to be uh, really bars, so they didn't want to go there. Oh, yes. I mean, I've heard. I wasn't there, but yeah. oh, yes. And it's all been cleaned up. It's absolutely beautiful. But what I love and treasure about Newport is that it, it doesn't look like it's changed. It's just been refreshed. You know, like you know, the Dowager took a young lover. Uh, if you came today and saw it, you wouldn't see one house missing on Bellevue Avenue. It's um, it's amazing because I travel a lot and I am appalled at what's happening to residential areas. Not only tearing down and building something totally inappropriate, but then the other option is to just uh, renovate and enlarge to the point where it's totally out of scale for the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Either, neither one of those are attractive, and that, knock on wood, has not happened to Newport. Because I think it is so exquisite, and it has such a history that you just, that you just embrace. Like, like my friend at um, Seaweed, he thought he was just going to buy a little beach house. And suddenly he turned, spent millions on basically a house that was falling down, and um, it's been given another 150 years. So, something about Newport that brings out something in people they don't even know, but they don't tear things down in Newport, really. Yes? Doris Duke is important to New Jersey. What did she do in Newport? She is responsible for probably restoring 60 to 70 um, 18th um, century houses, the colonial houses. She also brought some in, but she created the uh, Restoration Foundation. And um, it's still going strong. And the good thing about what she um, restored and brought in is that they're all houses that are rented. And I mean, that is part of the Restoration Foundation and the um, funding, or how they, they gain um, funding. <clears throat> and real people live in those houses. But the, the Restoration Foundation keeps them up, keeps them painted, et cetera. It's probably one of the best deals in Newburgh was the. The rent is not very much at all, and there are probably at least 60 houses. So it's really, I mean, that. thank you for bringing that up. Um, she, uh, she was a well, major, major benefactor to Newport in many ways. And that, that one is a, a, a legacy that she left that is visual and is not going to change either. So that's, you've got, you know, between Doris Duke and, you know, 1,700 houses, you're at 1,700. And up to present day, you've got 300 years of houses, exquisite houses. So, any other questions? All right. Well, I want to thank you and uh, the gift of our time for signing. And you can take a little bit of Newport home with you. And Elizabeth, if you could please take us out. Take us out. <laughs> I want to say good evening and I want to thank you all for attending tonight. I think that this is another reason that makes Morgan so wonderful in building the community in this town. And Baxter has been a longtime supporter of Morgan, working in many different ways, helping with the beautiful home, keeping it up and functioning for all the many visitors, and helping in volunteer ways with Morgan and May, and supporting this lecture. And I want to thank you all for coming out tonight 
and supporting Morgan is what makes this community fabulous. And remember to go home and wash your hands. <laughs>